In today's brief video, we're going to check out two new plugins for WordPress. One is free, one is on a very special offer at this point in time. First, what we're going to take a look at is Fluent Auth. Now, this comes from WP Manage Ninja, the people behind Fluent CRM, those kinds of tools. So it's got a bit of a heritage behind it for creating solid plugins for WordPress. So what exactly is Fluent Auth? Well, this allows you to handle the authorization and logging in for your WordPress website, among a few other things. If we take a quick look at the website, which we linked in the description below, you can see some of the features we have, things like two-factor login, we've got magic login via email, we've got detailed audit logs, you've got different things like security email notifications, and a range of other things. You're probably going to find there's going to be an overlap if you're using security plugins, for example, like iTheme Security. You may have duplicate information, for example, failed login attempts, those kinds of things. So once you've gone ahead and installed the plugin, Going to go into the dashboard of WordPress and you'll see we have a new entry called Fluent Auth. If we open this up, the first thing you're going to land on is the dashboard. And this is going to give us a overview of what the plugin is doing, what is handled, failed logins, login attempts, those kinds of things. So if we take a quick look, you can see it gives us a very brief overview and we can change the duration of this. We can have a single day, last 30 days and so on how many failed logins, how many blocked logins, and how many successful logins. So if your site is under attack, you're going to get a lot of information inside here. Now, if we take a look underneath, you can see we've got the recent failed login attempts. It'll tell us the IP address. It'll tell us the username that was attempted, the time, the browser, those kinds of things. We'll come on to the information that's being stored here in a moment. Underneath, you can see we've got a settings overview, and we can handle this. Some of these are security-based things which are recommended to handle, and again, we'll take a look at those in the settings section. And any successful logins will be listed on the right-hand side. So if you have a site that has multiple users, you can see the successful logins. If we hop over into the log section, this is going to give us a breakdown of the failed logins, the successful logins, and some information around it. If we take a look, you can see we've got success, failed, the login username, the user ID if it's applicable, the location or how they actually accessed it, those kinds of things. But what I'm interested in is the IP address. Now, obviously, if you're in a country that handles GDPR, so you're going to need to make sure you've got something in place specifying that you are storing these IP addresses. Now, you can go ahead and delete any of these, so you can easily remove them, but it would be nice to see a sort of bulk action. So if we go into, for example, the failed, it would be nice to sort of just select all the failed ones and then delete them, or all the successful ones, you know, whatever you kind of want to get rid of. So it would be nice to see if they'll give us the option to just bulk select based upon what we filter at the top. And you can go ahead and search, and we can drill down if you want to, to find what was going on. So you can see the error, the username and password is invalid. Please try a different combination. The user agent, in other words, what browser, what operating system and so on they were using. So that's the logs. Pretty simple, but probably more than enough than what you need. Moving on to the settings section, we've got some core security settings at the top. Now, these are different options you can disable, and they're recommended from a security point of view. Now, it's worth bearing in mind, if you're using some plugins, they may rely upon the features that are disabled if you choose those options. For example, things like the XML RPC. If you're using a plugin like Jetpack, you may have certain features enabled that rely upon these features to be enabled as well. So if you disable them inside the Fluid Auth plugin, make sure you test everything out to make sure that everything is still working. Now, if we take a look in the top corner, we have this Apply Recommended Settings. If we enable that, you can see this disables those first three options from a security point of view. It makes sense to remove them. Bearing in mind, not just checking that your plugins still work, if you're using a security plugin like iTheme Security, for example, you may find these options are enabled stroke disabled in there as well. So make sure you don't have conflicting information going on between the two different options. Next up, we've got our login security settings, and this allows us to limit the number of tries that an IP address can actually do. This can stop your website being hammered if someone's trying to get in when they shouldn't, or from the same IP address, or maybe a range of IP addresses. This will allow five attempts before that gets blocked for a defined number of minutes. In this case, 30, which is the default, but you could set that higher or lower should you wish. Again, Make sure that you don't have settings set inside you and settings set inside your security plugin because they could conflict with each other. Probably better to use the security plugin and disable those things inside you. 
Next up, you've got your extended login options. And this is where you can do things like enable magic login. Now, this is a really useful thing when you're testing a site out. You may have technical issues. You need to supply credentials to a software company or developer or something. This allows you to create a magic link which will have temporary credentials. They can click that link, have access to the site based upon what roles you want to allow them, and then once that kind of expires, they no longer have that access and they don't ever see passwords, usernames, and things like that. If you enable that, you can see this now allows us to disable it for various different roles. And this shows us the standard normal WordPress roles. And if you've got plugins like WooCommerce installed, and if you created your own custom user roles, they'll all be listed inside here. So we can enable or disable that. Next up, you've got your two-factor authentication via email. So if you want to make sure you've got an extra level of security, you can enable this and you can see select roles that require two-factor authentication. And again, you can see all those roles are available to us inside you, including any custom roles. So by enabling those options, you can add an extra level of security on top of a standard WordPress login. And then you've got some other settings. So automatically delete logs after a set number of time. So you can set this to be seven days, 14 days, whatever you want. Or if you want to keep them forever, you can set this to zero. I would recommend that you have this delete the logs after a short-ish period of time on a busy site because it can very quickly mount up and fill your database up with a lot of junk. And it makes it more difficult then to kind of keep track of things. So you can set that to what you want. I'm going to set this to be seven in this example. You can then do things like send email notifications if any follow of the following user roles log in. So if you want to monitor administrators or editors or authors or things like that, you can set what role or roles you want to be notified of when they log in. And you can see you can send an email notification when a user gets blocked, and this will use the standard admin email address, or you can go ahead and replace this with your own custom email address should you want to. We'll click on save on there to make sure that everything is saved out. Next on our list is the social logins option. So if you want people to be allowed to log into your website using their social media account information, you can enable it inside here. All we need to do is select this and then we can say enable login with GitHub or enable login with Google. Hopefully this will be something that will expand above and beyond just these two options to give us more control over this if you want to enable that. Personally, I'm not the biggest fan. I think it kind of makes it a little bit less secure in the long term. But you do have those options should you want to use them. We'll disable that. Next up, we've got the login and sign up forms. Now, by default, this is just going to use the standard WordPress ones. However, we can override that in a various different ways. If we enable this, you can see we have four different types of forms we can access. The authentication flow short code, the only registration, only login and password reset. So the final three are basically the standard WordPress ones, whereas the first one gives you more control over this and have more features included in it. Now, that's all pretty cool, and you can use these shortcodes any way you want, so you can easily create custom login pages and things like that. But the power of this comes in underneath. You can see we've got this shortcode that includes the same as we've seen above. However, there's more. There's this redirect to and your URL. So if you want to redirect them to a specific page or location on your site after they log in or after they, they sort of register or after they reset their passwords, you can do that inside here by using this short code. So that's pretty cool to see we can enhance the standard features that WordPress gives us. For now, though, I'm going to disable that. And then we've got your login redirects. Again, we can enable this. And you can see this allows us then to define just basic redirect URLs. So a default login you redirect, default logout. So you can set up custom ones on there. But the power of this is a little bit more kind of hidden away underneath. This is the advanced redirect rules. If we add a rule in, this now allows us to go ahead and create custom rules. So we can choose between user roles and user capabilities. So your user roles, again, are your admins, your editors, those kinds of things. User capabilities, this is where you've got the different capabilities that different user roles may have access to. For example, can they edit themes? Can they activate plugins and so on? This is really granular, getting right the way down to the nitty gritty and restricting things based upon very specific things. For most users, way overboard. Most people are going to be more than happy sticking with the user roles and then choosing from any of the standard user roles that you have as part of WordPress. So for example, we'll choose the editor and we can add more than one. We can add editor and author. I see the login redirect URL. So we can put in a custom redirect inside there for the login page and we can do exactly the same for the log out. 
So we could use this in a combination with the login and the sign up forms, create custom pages, and then set this up to handle various different user roles or capabilities, and then handle the redirection for various different logins and logouts. Pretty powerful if you have a need for that side of things. And that basically is the Fluent Auth plugin. I think if you have a need for this side of things, it is very, very useful. If you want to have custom redirects, those kinds of things, all those things are inside there. And the fact that it's free is pretty cool. So you may want to check it out. The link is in the description down below. Next on the agenda is an animation tool from CSS Hero, the same company that I've been using their software for quite some time for visually editing CSS on websites. I've covered it in several different videos. And if you want to check those out, I'll put a link in the description. However, what exactly is CSS Hero Animator? Well, as its name suggests, it's a tool that allows you to animate parts of your website. So if you want to create visual interaction, movement, and those kinds of things, this allows you to do it. Now, obviously, parallels are going to be drawn between motion.page, which is probably the most well-known tool for doing this kind of thing. Basically using GSAP animation, but making it a visual editor to make it much, much easier. Are they comparable? I haven't tested the both of them out enough to give a solid answer to that. So I would recommend doing a little bit of research yourself. If you're a motion page user, you may find that CSS Hero Animator doesn't do what you want and vice versa. But let's, before we further, let's take a look at the pricing between the two of them. For example, if we take a look at the pricing for yearly when it comes to motion.page, for unlimited websites, that's currently 119 euros plus taxes. If you're in the UK, that's VAT at 20%. However, if we take a look at the CSS Hero Animator, you can grab this at the moment for 40% saving for unlimited sites for 12 months for $29. The full price is only around $59. So it's considerably cheaper for unlimited sites if it does what you want it to do. So now we've kind of seen what it is. Let's take a quick look at the interface and how you'd work with things. So it's very easy to get started using CSS Heroes Animator. You'll see a new entry at the top of our dashboard. We'll click to open that up. And this then opens up your homepage with the animation timeline and everything all set out for you. So let's take a quick look. You can see we've got this timeline underneath. And if I scroll down until we get to something I've already gone ahead and test animated, if I select that, you can see this now opens up all the animation properties. And you'll see if I click on any of these, that don't have any kind of effects applied to them, we can then go ahead and set what we want. But if you've got one that's actually got some animation applied to it, it'll show us the animation timeline. And this is where we can animate various different aspects from viewport height positions to scroll pixels to time-based animations. You can see we can adjust things like opacity, the movement, all those different options are available. And we want to tweak it. We can adjust that very easily by simply dragging any of these keyframes to wherever we want. So let's, for example, say we choose this option. We'll choose this item, and then you can see we can choose between viewport height, scroll pixels, or time. And underneath, we get a little bit of information about that particular feature. So for example, if we come into viewport height and we click on plus, we can then choose what type of animation do we want. If we've accidentally chosen viewport and we wanted a different animation type, well, we can come in and we can choose one of the other options. So scroll pixels, time, and we've even got presets inside here. So you can see we can adjust various different things like card moves, combined, parallax shadows, and those kinds of things. Let's choose the viewport height. And then you can see we can do things like adjust the background height, the background position, the background size, apply a blur effect, font sizes. There's a lot of different things you can do on here. So once you kind of choose what you want, so for example, we'll choose blur, we can click apply. And that now applies that blur effect into it. So you can see as we scroll up, it gets more blurred. And as you can see, the timeline underneath adjusts. And we can adjust different points of this. So we can adjust the central point of this. So we can adjust the position of that. And that will adjust the amount of blur and when that blur actually takes effect. If you want to make the animation quicker or shorter or longer, you can adjust that inside here as well. You want to add something else in? You want to add another step in? You can add a step in. You want to Delete this, you can do that. You want to add another item inside here? Well, you can do that too. We can come in, we can click on the plus to add another animation, and we can choose something else. So for example, we may say we want to add a box shadow. We'll click apply, and you see the box shadow now has been applied to it. So when we scroll down, any box shadow effect will apply. Now you can't see it very well because obviously there's a blur on top of that, but you can just make out there's the little bit of a blurring around it, and the shadow is kind of appearing. The nice thing with this is it's all done visually. So you can literally select what you want and you can see then we've got this entry that shows us exactly what element we've got. We can open this up. We can find more information about it. 
We can undo things. We can switch between the light and the dark theme, depending on how you like to work. You want to check out what's going to look on mobile, where you can switch it to mobile view, and you can check it on there as well. You can open up the toggle grid, which allows you to see things like your 50% position of your animations. If you're working on the position of the viewport height, this gives you a visual way of being able to see what's going on there. And you can fine tune and refine any of your animations should you want to. You can disable those. You've also got the code inspector, which will literally show us all the code that's being used. And you can see that shows all the bits of code. Close that down. You've also got a debug option. So this will show you all the code that's being used in the JSON file, and it tells you everything is okay. But if there's a problem, it'll tell you there's a problem. And finally, you've got the option then to dock the editor. So you can have this floating if you want to, or you can just kind of show and hide it very easily. We've also got things like smooth scroll. So if you want to enable or disable that, so it'll scroll as normal, or you want to apply a more smooth scroll effect to your browser, you can do that. Personally, I'm not a big fan of smooth scroll because it always feels like you're kind of scrolling through treacle. It's a little bit weird. But anyway, if you want to apply loop animation, you can do that inside here as well. So it allows you to smooth scroll elements, it applies to parallax scroll elements, and we've got nothing, but you can adjust that should you want to. I'm not a big animation expert, but for a starting point, this looks pretty good. And knowing CSS Hero, this is just the starting point. So I think the animation features will expand and get more. It's already very, very smooth and streamlined to work with, but that's a kind of first look at what you get with CSS Hero Animator. And the links to both of these plugins will be in the description down below. And I welcome your feedback. Let me know what you think of either or both of these tools. As always, my name is Paul C. This is WP Tats, and until next time, take care.